name's Midori Connolly. I am the quote unquote cheap baby girl, and you always say that tongue in cheek because <laughs> it is kind of silly. I get it. Um, I didn't necessarily name myself that. Um, it was a nickname that was given to me some time ago because my approach to technology has always been a little bit differently. Uh, different. I started in high tech when I was about 19 or so, and um, I was working for an adult and adolescent learner um, educational software company. Back in the days of, uh, you know, like Windows 95, and, and we were trying to deliver um, distance learning over some really crazy uh, technology that just really wasn't ready for what we were trying to do with adaptive learning and everything else. But um, so that was my start in technology, and so I took a little bit of a break, and then came back to it via the staging industry. So I had a staging company for about seven years in Southern California. Um, never was in Southern California, but that's where we were based, um, based out of San Diego. And so I brought that approach that I had had early in my years of, um, you know, trying to do different things with technology, trying to fill needs, and started approaching the, the staging industry that way, right? So I brought a little bit of a different perspective to things. And that's sort of how this whole name, the AD girl, kind of came about. Because I just did it differently, right? I took a different approach to the thing, and I really started focusing on the experience. Less a little bit on just the actual technology and the nuts and bolts, and really thinking about, well, what are we, what's the end product here? Because I think that that's what happens if we get really stuck in um, you know, looking at the zeros and the ones, and what makes it digital, and why, and why does it work this way, and we kind of forget about the end product, which is really what sells, right? We are in the communications business, and I think we, we forget about that sometimes, because we get so caught up in the technology that we love, right, but we forget about our end goals. So with that being said, my sessions run a little bit differently. I don't do, I mean, I do an hour, I'll talk for an hour if you let me talk for an hour, but at any time you can raise your hand and have a question or you want to share an idea, feel free. I don't do anything where it's 45 minutes, hold all those thoughts until the last 15 minutes, because um, we'll run out of time. <laughs> I'll talk for a full hour and, and, and keep you awake and keep you on, but if you have questions or if anything comes from, oh, we're not streaming this one, so never mind. But um, if anything comes up, feel free to ask me, because what I'm going to ask you to do during this session um, is to sort of open your mind a little bit. And I have a five-year-old, oh, she just turned six. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. And we watched a lot of SpongeBob around our house. And in this particular episode, SpongeBob and Patrick have this cardboard box, right? Low tech. But they go in that box and they use their and they use the imagination. And every time there's this little rainbow. And they use their imagination and they create all these crazy worlds inside of this cardboard box. And of course, it drives their neighbor Squidward crazy because he's like, you know, what are you doing in the box, right? And, and they're racing cars, and they're doing all these things. So what I want you to do today is use your imagination. So I'm going to talk about some of the trends in technology and communication and what's happening out there that really could impact um, our, our services and the way we provide these services, the way we position ourselves at, as an industry at large. Um, and, we're, and in order to do that, you're going to have to use a little imagination. So we're just going to kind of stretch and do some future. It's not quite Gary, you know, it's not quite his crystal ball, but it's a little bit along those lines and really thinking about, you know, what we are trying to do. So this is our plan today, just kind of looking at digital culture and looking at the human behavior um, in a digital culture because we're living in this community of users who are a digital culture. We'll talk about the Internet of Things um, or the industrial Internet. Um, which is really sort of, I think, the hottest, hottest uh, trend in technology we start to see in user experience. We'll talk about AD 3.0. So let's talk about this digital culture. When we talk about culture, it's important to remember that what I show you and what we talk about, these are not hard and fast rules. These are sets of behaviors and expectations that the user has now, that an event attendee has, that a student has, that um, you know, a, an employee has. It's not about, well, this is how we have to do it, but these are certain sets of behaviors that have adapted over time. Really what we've seen is as people started to have different experiences online, right, where they're able to, to <coughs> live in virtual worlds and they're able to communicate with someone in Russia 24 hours a day at no cost, now they want that connectivity and they want that pace and, and pace and they want access and they
they want. All of these types of experiences that they've been able to have online, they want them in the offline world. And that's sort of how we can help make that happen. So thinking about this, these people that, you know, sort of reflects that 2.0 culture, you know, where the internet became less about reading an, a, a reading an article and maybe emailing it to someone and actually interacting with that article, right? And Web 2.0, being able to interact, and push and pull, and have a conversation with content and become content creators and sh content sharers. Um, this is what they're doing in the offline now. So now you have this sort of community of users, right? So we're not defining this by region, we're not defining this by type of person, but really sort of a community, thinking about a group of people who are really connected, interactive. Um, they are very, very social and participatory, and some of you may you know, be, be familiar with the idea of the participatory culture, which is really where education has moved and where we've seen, um, even in, corp in the corporate environment, we've really started to see participatory culture, right, where everybody has a role and there's all equal participation, less about, you know, a teacher is sage on the stage, right? So. Um, really about everybody creating an experience and contributing to that. Um, and then also people who like to be in control of their experience, right? I don't like this website, I don't like this experience, I'm gonna let you know about it and I have the tools to do that. So um, they're also on the move, right? Everybody's mole. We are on the move, we can have instant, instant access to these experiences no matter where we're at. So let's take a look at that. So talking about these people being social and interactive, um, this gives you an idea of, you know, I, I say it's hyperactive, right? So in 20 minutes on Facebook, we look at all the activity that happens. There's, you know, 2 million um, uh, or almost 3 million photos <coughs> uploaded, um, almost 3 million messages are sent. So people are busy in 20 minutes on Facebook, right? These are staggering numbers. But what is really important to note here is that 10 million comments are made in 20 minutes. I mean, that's three times as many of any other number there on this page. So what that means is people want to talk, right? They're social. They want to talk. They want to interact. When you comment on Facebook, that means you're having a conversation, right? So it's not a message. It's not a, you're sending an email waiting for a response. It's sort of a quicker pace, right? I'm commenting on this. I've, I've had my piece. I want to hear what you're going to say back to me. So it's sort of just a really quick type of conversation. So they're social. They're hyperactive, they're interactive. Um, so, and then just to kind of look at some, a little more of this activity, right? It's important to remember that, um, uh, that no longer are we just viewers, right? We, like I said, we're having conversation. People are not just creating social profiles and leaving them there. They're actually doing something, right? So they're, they're social. Um, over half of all Americans are on Facebook. And it's not just kids, right? It's important to remember that you know this this age group, 45 to 54, is the largest growing group within social networking um, sites. So these are baby boomers, right? I mean, these are people, professionals. Um, this is not just for kids and teenagers. And, and it's so funny because I'll say that, and I and I'm like, I know everyone already knows this, right? But actually, the perception still is that this social experience, the online social experience, is really for the 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 Gen Y and the Millennials. It's all about the Millennials. Well, below me, because look at that. <laughs> look at how many baby boomers are actually really active, and they have the same ex expectations now for an experience, the difference being that they kind of have the pocketbook to go with it, right? So they have the buying power that maybe a Millennial doesn't. So they do have some of the same expectations. My father's on Facebook. He teaches me something new every week. He's actually super annoying on Facebook. He's like Mr. Stalker, and I hope he never watches this recording. Sorry, Papa. Um, but you know, he's he's hyperactive. The guy is on Facebook like 24 hours a day. I don't know what he's doing otherwise. Besides, I think I don't think he I think he goes fishing and then does Facebook, and that's like his life. But anyways, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that this is not just for a certain generation. It, I really want you to understand that it crosses all generations. Um, you know, something else that's really interesting, too, is that it's about the communication that's happening, too. As I showed, you know, with the 10 million comments, um, they say that 22% of people on the internet spend their time on social networks, and then 19% of their time on the internet is spent sending emails or communicating. So really, you know, almost half of their time is just spent talking to one another. That's what people are doing. And then the rest of the time they're searching. What are they searching for? But then I realize, like, the other day I searched, you know, you know, it was something so dumb. I'm like, why did I just search for 
and that I probably could have just called my mom and asked, you know, it's like, how do I boil an egg? So the other big part of their time is spent searching for information. So again, there's that connected piece, right? We want to be connected to information instantly. Um, so the other thing, too, is considering how many people are on the move and, and the way that mobile has just permeated our lives. Um, so if you look at some of these numbers, right, 91% um, of Americans have cell phones. Um, over half of all American adults have smartphones, right? So we are a wired world that is on the move, we're mobile, we're connected. And what's really important to remember about this is the way that we communicate with people, right? So here's the thing. <laughs> they say that 87% of all iPhone users admit to sleeping with their phone. How do you do it? Does anybody else sleep with their phone? You don't have to admit it. You don't have to raise your hand, but some of you are out there. Now, we all have different reasons for doing that. And I mean, literally, it's on the, the pillow next to me. I'm single mom. Something happens. I don't have a house phone. Something happens. I need to be able to knock down that one one, right? I have reasons for doing it, but I still do it. And that phone is like the first thing, I, the last thing I look at when I go to bed, you know, good night. <laughs> first thing I look at when I wake up in the morning, this is my alarm as well. This is my little eye brain is what I call it. You know, it's labeled eye brain. If you look for it, it's on the network. <laughs> Dory's eye brain. Um, we use these phones for everything. They say that I think the number is like 78% of all Android users admit to using their phones on the toilet. So, hey, <laughs> glad I'm not phone user and I just sleep with my phone. <laughs> you droid users are using them in the toilet. Just kidding. But no, I think that what's so important to think about is that, you know, these phones are connected to us in the most intimate ways, right? So if we do choose to engage on that level and some type of communication and we think about how our technology is going to mesh with that type of experience, right? So people are interacting with this extremely high-tech device, this tool, to get a job done, and they're doing it like 24 hours a day. So we need to think about, well, how does our technology interact with that? How do we reflect that type of connectivity and that type of um, experience, right? So in literally, like the emotional connections, the, the, the ease of use, how will we replicate that using the technology that we sell, that we design, that we spec? So again, you know, thinking about, well, and then how do we tie into that? How do we tie into that intimacy that this little device has with our users? So important to keep all of that in mind. Um, so here's one interesting thing, too. Um, if this is the way that we use mobile, that sometimes we don't think about, right? So this is um, this was actually in Korea, I believe it was in Seoul, and it was in a subway station. So it's a virtual grocery store. So there's they actually set up a grocery store in a subway station, um, where you could browse the aisles just like you were at the grocery store and do all of your shopping here and check out just like you were at the grocery store. So using QR codes, they would go through and just scan the products they needed. And then either you have a delivery service, bring the groceries to you, or a pickup service. So thinking about, you know, people are using their phones in different ways. We want our experiences to sort of reflect the ability to do what we need to do at any time of the day with our phones, using, you know, that immediate, instant gratification, staying connected, and having experiences. Um, I think that's actually one of my favorite things, is just how cool would that be to go to the Go to the grocery store while you're waiting for a subway. <laughs> Make my life. I don't use a subway, but if I did, <laughs> that would be great. Anyway, so um, the other thing too is thinking about this idea of social, mobile, and local. Um, local can also mean location. Um, it's really where this intersection of social and mobile have come together. Um, they call it social discovery. Uh, as people are out there, they're, they're discovering, right? They're using their mobile device to discover the world around them. So whether it be something like, um, you know, using a, a Yelp monocle, right? So, um, or is it Google monocle? I can't even remember, but I think it's Yelp, where you're searching the world around you for, you know, a good restaurant, um, a dog groomer, you know, whatever it may be that you're looking for in a certain place, you're using that device to find it. Then you're also sharing that, right? So it's sort of this circular experience because other people are sharing it. You're finding the information that you need, helping you to stay connected. Um, there are some apps out there that are helping people to do this better. One of the big, big ways that we've seen in the events industry in particular is using this type of a dis discovery app for the discovery of people. 
right? Because that's one of the challenges that we have is finding people that are relevant to us. And this is a huge hot trend, um, sort of this social discovery of finding the networks of people who are important to us and who are relevant. So curious in that that does this, um, we've seen it used at a certain, a few events where people will use, they'll create a profile and they can tie in their social, existing social networks of something like a Facebook or a LinkedIn profile. And then um, based on the uh, parameters that the event organizer creates, so they can, um, you know, their interests are, like here it says marketing, social media, angel investing, you know, if it's a programmer's conference or some other type of, um, you know, they could say what language they program in or some, something that would help them meet the people they need to meet, right? So finding parameters to match each other. And then based on that, as you go into the event, you actually have like a little radar around you that shows, oh, you get pinged when somebody where you know, you're matched on certain interests, you're within a certain area of each other, right, proximity, you're pinged, you're notified, hey, so-and-so is here, you're matched on four out of five things, that gives you a score of 76 out of 100, right? So 76 out of 100% um, means that you know, that's how likely you are to have something in common and to get to want to know each other. So, um, you know, this is just one example. There are also some other ones out there we've seen, sonar, highlights, um, big, big trend, right? So people doing the social discovery, using these social tools, using the mobile tools, and based primarily on their location, so where they're at. Um, and, and, you know, as the technology has evolved, we've seen that happen. Now, the other thing that, um, about this digital culture is that people like to be in control, right? So they like to be in control of their experience um, because they, for so long now, have been able to dictate what happens to them, you know, on the internet, where, you know, we're, we're able to personalize just about everything. We're able to affect great change at an individual level. Has anybody heard of change.org? Have you heard of change.org? One person has. Um, so change.org is a website. It's like um, for petitions, basically. Now, <laughs> this is really incredible, and I think this is, it really, really shows how our expectations of experience have changed. Um, Change.org allows you to create a petition for anything from, you know, I saw something where one woman created a, a petition in India to eliminate the caste society in her town, in her village. She did it through this petition system. Now here's something that we only understand. Um, there was a 17 year old boy who was really upset with the Abercrombie and Fitch. Um, oh, no worries about that. I'm, I'm, it will never bother me. We are connected, remember? Um, so he was really, really upset about the idea that Abercrombie and Fitch didn't have large and extra large sizes, or they didn't have XL and double XL. And he, he was really further upset when um, you know, he had read about one of the marketing um, uh, executives had said, well, we want to be positioned as the you know, we want only the cool kids to be wearing Abercrombie and Fitch. That's one of the reasons why they didn't have larger sizes, right? So this boy said, that is so wrong. You know, I can't believe that, right? So you're telling me that you can't be an XL or a double XL and be cool? Only the cool kids are the skinny ones? So he started a petition against Abercrombie and Fitch. Two weeks later, he had 75,000 signatures. Two weeks after that, he found himself sitting in the office with the senior executives at Abercrombie and Fitch, giving them insight, giving them feedback on how they might be able to change that and what they could do. Look, I get goosebumps even just when I tell this story, right? This is a 17-year-old boy who didn't like something. We hear these stories more and more and more, right? And, and he didn't do it just for, you know, I complained because I didn't like my service today, he was trying to create something and change something in the world that needed to be changed. So change.org, you know, check it out. But the point is that we have different expectations, right? Um, I had a bad experience on Delta the other day. I put it on Twitter to my six or 8,000 followers. Like, has anybody else ever had this before? Within five minutes, I had a message from Delta, you know, from the, a private message saying, hey, get, you know, get in touch with us, let us know how we can maybe work on this together. Right, so I'm one person. I didn't do it to cause a problem, but I just said, hey, is there anyone else who has not this problem? What do you think we can do about it? So we as individuals have a lot of power and we are really, we really expect to be in control of our experience. We are media creators, right? But I, as I put up there, 57% of all internet users can be, can be considered media creators, right? And I can go out there and I can create some 
fabulous multimedia um, content and put that on my blog and everyone can see it. I create video blogs all the time. I created one for this event, inviting people to come here. Granted, it wasn't a multimedia, fascinating multimedia production. It was just me sitting and recording a video. But still, I'm creating multimedia, right? So we are media creators as well. So um, one other thing, too, is um, sort of the expectations of students, right, and how the classroom is evolving. And I talk about the classroom because, you know, this is sort of the next generation of workers and just individuals who are entering the workplace and everything else. But really, it's not just for students. I mean, I think about, because what's, what we've seen is this type of experience and culture reflected in our meetings and conferences that we serve. We're seeing it in the, in the um, corporate workplace, right, where people, as, as you've heard, you know, BYOD, bring your own device, is huge, right? So Nearpod is an iPad application. This is just one example of an iPad application where, you know, your teacher controls, your teacher, your um, administrators control, and all of the multimedia that's created for a classroom. They choose who's going to see what. And then kids walk in with their tablets. In this case, an iPad. They walk in with their tablets. and. Um, you know, they're able to go into their app and they see the multimedia that's been created just for them, the experience that's been created just for that student or that cluster of students. They have an individualized experience. You know, they almost have their own curriculum, right? So this is sort of that adaptive learning, sort of. Um, and this is just an example of how the classroom has changed, right? So the students are interacting with that content right here in front of them as well and not necessarily up here. Right, so thinking about that, the other thing too is the access to education, right? So this is sort of transforming that feeling of being in control and the accessibility to content that's relevant to just us. Um, has anybody ever done a Coursera class? Or have you heard of Coursera? Um, this, so you, have you done a class before? Did, was your experience good? Yeah. yeah. So um, Coursera is one of the, oh god, it's a MOOC, M-O-O-C, a massive, open, online course. course, thank you. <laughs> I am horrible, horrible with acronyms. I mean, it's a good thing my name's not an acronym or I forget what it's good for. But anyways, Coursera is, um, they're free classes, right? So I just signed up for one um, from a, a, to do a, it's a, like an e-learning class for educators um, out of Scotland, right? So it's uh, out of a university in Scotland. You can take classes from MIT, you can take classes from Stanford. You don't necessarily get college credit for it, but you still get the same curriculum. You still get access to this community of students. You still get to have a learning experience. I've taken an artificial intelligence class. That was fantastic. It was so far away my head of the world. But it was free, and I tried it out, and I met cool people, and I read a lot of great things, and I learned something. And this was from a class at MIT, right? So, hey, I got MIT caliber education for free. So people are, you know, and then Khan Academy, are you familiar with Khan Academy? So quite a few familiar with Khan Academy. Same kind of concept, right? Where students aren't reliant just on what's happening in the classroom anymore, right? We have access to content. We can control our education. Khan Academy, I'm sorry if you don't know, is an online catalog of, um, uh, like, tutorials, right? So um, Sal Khan started this when his uh, seventh grade niece, or cousin, and was struggling with math. So he started giving her online lessons on YouTube, right? And now it's funded by the Gates Foundation, right? So again, you know, you can go on YouTube and your kids can get the education they need um, without necessarily needing that teacher, right? So this is really that sort of democratization of experience and control over our experience. And this is what's happening out there. Um, Another thing too we've started to see is like the use of Prezi. Um, has anybody used Prezi before? A couple of you. So Prezi is a presentation software, um, sort of somewhere in the realm of a, a PowerNote or PowerNote or a Keynote, a PowerPoint or a Keynote. Um, but it lets you create uh, presentations sort of in a white space and a and you can use it as a collaborative tool, which I'll show you, show you in a second. But it starts as sort of a white space. And you imagine you walk up to a whiteboard. And not many people think in a linear fashion, right? It's like not a lot of us go, okay, slide one, slide two, right? I mean, your thoughts sort of bounce around. And, and as they come to you, you want to capture them. But it's hard sometimes because you're like, well, but that doesn't follow that slide. Where am I going to put that? Um, and we will try to do an outline. But Prezi sort of lets you just capture your ideas in a white space, right? And you can move around. Yes? The presentation. 
presentation, the keynote this morning was in Prezi. Did Gary do his in Prezi? Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. funny. Yeah, I do a lot of my stuff in Prezi. It takes a little bit of time to put it all together is the problem, but it is visually quite stimulating, and it's it can be fun to use. Sometimes for me it works great. I do sometimes proposals in Prezi because it lets me just flow through a presentation and through a proposal um, or jump around as I want to without going, oh, let me go back to um, slide, you know, what was that? You can actually move around the presentation. Now, one of the things that we've seen is, so here's an example of that collaboration and people sort of wanting to participate in, experience, in an experience. A lot of times when I do presentations, I will give everyone, you can do up to 10 people in the presentation editing with you at once. So I'll set up a Prezi space for my audience to log in and start sharing ideas with me or asking questions. Um, and this I have found to be very transformative, right? So that you get more of a collaborative, a collaboration, and it gives people an opportunity to have a voice or share ideas. And the other cool thing is that afterwards I can take it, put it into a PDF document, and share it with everyone, right? So it, it also creates a good learning experience and learning opportunity to share good content with everybody. So if you have um, if you have clients who are kind of looking for, you know, well, what else could we do, you know, to sort of capture some of the content that's created either you know in our meetings or at our events? Prezi can be a kind of a fun and interesting way to do that. I've even done it where we set up one laptop because you can only have ten at a time, so we set up one laptop like per um, crescent, right, so per table, per group that was working together. So you can do games and, and everything else. You can get pretty creative with Prezi. Um, let's see, my next slide was a video, but I don't have audio, so we'll skip that. And look over here. Um, so the other thing to, as I mentioned before, is this idea of ow, <laughs> personalization. How many of you, when you go to a hotel, um, have the ability to pick your own pillow? Does anybody do that? Because you can do it at a few hotel chains. They'll let you actually choose your pillow type. Yeah. Yeah, you can, it goes into your profile, and when you show up, um, I think like Four Seasons has it, um, there are a couple other hotel chains that do this, but when you show up, your preferred pillow type is waiting for you, right? So I want, I, I do like the hypoallergenic flat pillow or something, I can't remember, like a choice of six pillows. Well, that's waiting for me. And now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I happen to have my own Amazon page. <laughs> Right? I mean, we each have our Amazon page. When I show up to Amazon, it says, welcome back, Dory. You know what you're going to like today? You know what else you might like? And here is something someone had to say about one of your lists, right? You go to Amazon, which is this massive place, massive marketplace, but you have your own personalized experience. And I have recommendations, and that's how I buy all my books, right? I, I wouldn't know what, how, what books to buy if it wasn't for my Amazon page. I buy great products there. What about Pandora? Everybody using Pandora? Pandora? So Pandora lets you personalize a radio station, right? So I have everything from like my Jack Johnson station to like my Bruno Mars station. I've got my Jay-Z station. I know it's totally guilty. <laughs> guilty uh, pleasure gangster rap. Anyways, um, you know, the mom rolling in the, <laughs> the station wagon. Anyways, so Pandora lets you customize a radio station, right? You put in maybe one or two artists or a type of music or a song, and, and then you have your own radio station. We are our own DJs, right? We get to create these experiences that are personalized just for us. <coughs> this is how empowered we are. So the problem with that is that you start to think about the individual experience. Does anybody recognize this from? Um, yeah. hmm? that's, yeah. And that's actually LAX. That's Tom Bradley. Yeah, that's International Terminal, which was a $730 million project renovation, right? Um, with one of the most beautiful, I think, um, installations that we've seen maybe in ever. I mean, it's, it's incredible, right? This, the, it is an AV, like, like in all its glory, right? Audio, video, wonderment. Um, actually, it's really just video wonderment if you think about it. But um, anyways, so what they've done is, and I'm going to create like, there's four hours of content. Um, you know, there's, you, you walk through, and it's this full artistic experience, and it's meant to make the airport a destination, right? It's meant to just make you feel like you've gone somewhere. And, and, and you're, you know, if you read the descriptions, it's like, it's all about the, um, it's all about the uh, 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 making dream of being somewhere else, right? Well, the problem with that is like, okay, when I'm traveling, right? I, okay, yeah, I do like when the airport looks cool and everything else, but you know what I'm doing while I'm traveling? I'm going like this. Oh, God, I'm so angry, right? I mean, I know the rest of you travel quite a bit. 
but you know what I'm talking about, because you had it timed down to 10 minutes. And, you know, the, the 10 minutes, and most people who are traveling through an airport tend to be business travelers, right? We're, we're there for a reason, we have somewhere to get to, we don't necessarily have time to experience the beauty of that airport. What I need, I need to show up, have a kiosk that says, oh, Ms. Connelly, you've arrived, your gate is this, your, your baggage drop is here, it's going to take you, your expected time is 25 minutes from the time you, you know, you walk by and tap your phone to this kiosk and you've been directed and all the places you need to go, you've got signage, you've got, you know, somebody who talks to you and, and, and you walk through security and you, you've got biometrics and everything else. That's what I want $730 million to be spent on, right? So this is beautiful, but it doesn't necessarily serve my needs. And I've gotten so used to having my own radio station, my own, you know, pillows, my own Amazon page. This is the experience I want to have. I want to have an easier time, not necessarily any more beautiful time. So the other side of that too is that the other, um, we, we now have so much access to technology. Has anybody seen the Leap Motion Controller? Anybody? So the Leap Motion Controller, so fun. I have one of these. So I now can control my entire system using gesture technology for the grand total price of $80. Um, Leap Motion was released, I think I got mine in like July, and they released it to beta testers. And so for $80, I've now turned my machine, I can control my presentations. Um, there's a great video of Ohio, at Ohio State, and I have downloaded it, but I don't know if it wouldn't play for some reason, not to not. Um, anyway, so at Ohio State, in their language resource center, um, a group of linguists, not AD professionals, nobody with any formal experience in integration or installation design, got, um, they, 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 they bought one of these elite motion controllers and they created their own gesture controlled holodeck, right? Their version of the holodeck. So they put up, you know, they were like, we basically did it with like spare parts we have laying around. We have three little projectors and so we put those up on the walls and, you know, they were like, we just kind of figured out some of the, the, the machinery that we had in our room, in our room, in our language resource center and created this interactive immersive holodeck. So now you go in, and they said, you know, their point was that they go in, they um, uh, you learn about a destination in the language, in your language classes, and then you go in and you walk into the destination and you control your movement through that destination using an $80 Elite Motion controller, right? So these guys put this immersive experience together with no formal training and with a, probably a budget of about, what, maybe a couple thousand dollars. I mean, they did it without it with $80 because they didn't have, you know, they already have the projectors. But you just think about that, right? I mean, this is incredible. So um, if you Google, it's on YouTube, Google uh, Leap Motion, um, Leap Motion Ohio State University, like, Language Center. I'm surprised nobody, somebody probably has already done it out here in the audience. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing too, right? That's, that's that instant, that's that quick. A lot of times people go, oh, I've got it right here if you want to see it. You know, this is, this is how it works. Um, so anyways, you know, this is the type of game changer Right, that we have to be aware of, that we have to be prepared, prepared for as professional audiovisual um, professional uh, audiovisual professionals. So Sonic Notify is another interesting way to sort of look at how we're connecting with people. Um, in the panel up here uh, earlier, um, I can't remember which panelist said it, but um, one of them was talking about you know audio and how we overlook the way that audio can sort of transform an experience, right? That happens all the time. I wrote a blog post a long time ago about, you know, um, a letter from audio, it's the A in AD, right? You know, everyone gets caught on my sexy, my sexy sister video, but I am important too, I count, and without me, you know, a lot of messages are missed, a lot of experience is missed. So, Sonic Notify is really interesting, and um, Sonic Notify uses the microphone on your phone. So I have, um, for instance, an app, and it's called Sonic X or something. I turn that on, I leave it open, and it runs in the background, and when I walk past a sound beacon, this could be, um, so this could be like at a concert, it could be in a retail environment. Um, when a certain sound goes off, it pings my phone, right? So the sound is not only sort of transforming my experience, but then it's also talking to me where I'm kind of caught up the most. Um, and there's some really interesting articles out there about how our world has become quieter, which is interesting, right? There's more of us, and there's more traffic, and there's more vehicles, and everything else, but our world has actually become 
quieter. The sound on our city streets has been reduced. We're sort of losing some of the auditory experience because everything we do is quiet, right? We're texting, we're reading content. We may be watching video, that's one of the only places that we still get sort of that sound experience online, but everything else is quiet. So people are walking through the world and it's a quieter place, and I think we may be missing something there, right? So it's important to think about the audio and how that impacts the experience. This is sort of an interesting and fun tool that kind of ties into that. Um, it's really good like at concerts, right? In a certain line is sung. Um, everybody in the, same, in the room has an experience at the same time. So using this device, using some of our tools, you create a reaction with the individual in that place they're kind of stuck looking at the most. So again, you know, this is really important to think about. This is that culture. These are the experiences people are having right now and sort of the expectations and behaviors of how they've changed. It's fun to kind of start thinking about this, right? Because what happens next is we start looking at, wow, right? This is where that imagination comes into place when you start thinking about what people are doing. Um, internet and the internet of things equals wisdom of the earth. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it was from the Chinese premiere. Um, and I'm going to say it wrong, but it's Wen Jibao, maybe. And um, the, anyways, Internet of Things is really looking at all of our devices, all of these, and not just, you know, not just um, smartphones, not just our laptops, but actually all of our devices. So our microphones, our coffee makers, our cars, all of these things that we use, all of these tools in our lives are starting to talk to one another, right? They're becoming smart. And they're creating this internet of things where they all live on a network and they talk to each other and they talk to us. And over time, they become smart and they start to know what we need. And they proactively um, anticipate our needs. So this is a quote um, that I'll, I'll let you read really quickly if you can't see it. Um, basically, it talks about the internet of things. Um, it talks about this market development an ecosystem of, of applications and devices that will all talk to one another. And really the idea here, which I like to point out, is the last line, which will improve and simplify EU citizens' lives. Really important as we look at this technology to remember that we're not doing this just because it's cool and it's a beautiful display or it's, it's supposed to improve and simplify somebody's life, right? So we're talking about the experience design and why the internet of things has really developed. Unfortunately, us not being part of the European Union, our lives will not be simplified or <laughs> improved. Just kidding, I just think it's funny. This just happened to come from the European Commission. So, um, you know, hopefully Americans' lives can be simplified and improved as well. But um, here's an idea. If you take a look at the Internet of Things, um, this is a great picture that came from Wired Magazine. And some of the other terms you'll hear about, I'll hear about are the programmable world, the internet of everything or the industrial internet. Industrial internet really comes from GE, that's sort of their push. Um, and, and you'll see there's some de divisive, divisiveness <coughs> amongst all of the different um, the creators and people are pushing the internet of things. But you see, so right here, you know, it's based on mutual interest, dating service, pre approved him to hit on her, right? So that's that thing where I was talking about people being connected. And presence tags help you find your friends here here, here. So based on these little tags you wear on your body, you know who's there. And you're notified, like, oh good, I've been trying to connect with that person. You write your order drinks by a smart phone, wait staff can find you in the crowd. This one I think is really interesting. Speakers auto-adjust to crowd for optimal acoustics, right? So thinking about, well, what if our speakers are smart enough that they're they're making measurements, you know, all the audio engineers are like, what? But you know, they're trying to make their own adjustments. Right? They're responding to the world around them. They're talking to one another, and they're talking to us as well. So there is an audio engineer. The speakers are giving that feedback to the audio engineers. So you think about this kind of concept where all of these things are really smart and they're talking to one another. Here's another idea of looking at sort of a, a neighborhood where the internet of things exists. Um, so this already exists. The dog tag texts you and wrote a leaf yard. That, that, we've already, we already have that. You know, the garage door closes, the lights turn off when you leave. Automation, hello, we've heard of that. How about this? Basketball court tracks your shot percentage. That's kind of funny. I don't know if I wanted to do that for me, though. Um, so let's see here, what else? The swim, oh, this is one of my favorites. So the swimming pool heats up when there's a barbecue on the calendar. 
Think about that. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? So that's how all these things become smart and talk to one another and anticipate our needs. Um, you know, what if that swimming pool gets smart over time and it starts to remember, well, you know, based on historical data in the system, um, you know, when you had a barbecue with this particular group of people that had kids, you know, the, the pool actually was heated to a warmer temperature. You would, you know, we took it to 84, you took it to 88. So we're, you know, this pool is the, the heater is smart enough. It's going to start thinking, well, it's that group. You know, would you like me to actually put it at 88, which is where you always put it, have put it in the past. So really think about how these, these things around us become smart. And I just like the fact that it's the word thing. Right? It's like so, it's so simple. Um, has anybody seen the if this, then that? Yes. Yeah, so do you use, do you make any recipes uh, for yourself? I found one that it works for me. Okay, so um, if this, then that is uh, a way to make recipes for various concoctions, right? So um, basically, like you could make something so simple as when I take a picture, it uploads to Dropbox, which Dropbox does itself, but <laughs> you can make it um, upload to Evernote. Right, so you can, when you, when you do an action, right, this is a programming thing. When you do one action, then this will happen. Well, these are the little Belkin um, Wemo uh, devices. Have you seen these, the Belkin Wemos? They sell them in Target, and they're like 50 or 60 bucks. And you can program them so they have motion sensors, they have power sensors, so you can create little recipes, right? So if I arrive at the airport and text, um, my lights will go on at home, right? So flashing at home to let my family know I've arrived. So, you know, fun and interesting concoctions exist out there. Now, this is the stuff that's really super important, right? These are the types of recipes that are going to change our lives, right? This is the stuff that, I, <laughs> that makes the world go round, knowing when my kitty cat has used the litter box. Hello. Like, really? Do we need to know that? But still, believe it or not, the pet industry is Huge. Um, I'll show you another uh, system that's out there right now that's really capitalizing on this. But you know, I mean, this is the type of thing. So you put one of these little memos next to the, the kitty litter box, and you know, because we all need to track that information, right? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> anyway, so looking also at um, you know, these are called stick and finds. Um, there's a little radar. So say, for instance, you put one of these little $25 tags on your keys because if you're like me, you lose your keys every 10 minutes. How's that even possible? I swear you put in the same place every time. But anyway, so you put them on your keys and when you walk into the, in your room or around your house, you actually have a little radar that's going to show you where the, that item may be. Maybe you put them on your kids, I don't know, um, if you're that bad. But so, you know, using sort of Bluetooth and proximity, you can find the things around you. Could be fun for game design. I think I'm so into gaming. But um, there's also, you know, looking at uh, the watch that's a payment system that's actually by um, that's a Mastercard. So using RFID, the RFID chips that exist in um, some of the new Visa cards and Mastercard, the credit cards. Um, have, does anybody have that one of these where you just kind of tap and pay using your credit card? And the, the big thing right now are the, the wallets that have the RFID blocker, right? So people can't just walk by with a little scanner and, and um, scan you. But so there's also a watch that does that as well. What is that called? I didn't write it down. I always forget the name of it, but it's like watch and pay or something. It's something like that. Um, but that exists, right? So we have a little uh, a device that will let us pay for something when we walk into a store. Pretty cool. Um, scary to some people, but there's usually an authentication. There's some type of level of authentication that you've got to verify it's you. So looking at the evolution of the Internet of Things, really we look at what, what's happening and where we expect them to go. Number one, things get a voice. Two, you know, things join the system. And then three, things get smart. And I'll just kind of go through this really quickly so you have an idea of what some of the technologies are being used. Um, so the first thing is creating a voice. Um, one thing is devices responding to motion, right? So just motion sensors. There's Bluetooth smart technology, which is the next generation of Bluetooth, right? It's Bluetooth, um, I can't remember if it's 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0, I don't know, I don't know that type of thing, but anyways. And so there's also um, location, so based on GPS and Wi-Fi triangulation, this is how devices know where you are or where they're living on the network. And then there's also NFC or near field communication. Um, near field communication is built on that RFID technology I just talked about, radio frequency identification. 
Um, the most early uses we saw of RFID were like the microchip and the, and the pet's net, right? So um, that's RFID technology. Even just our um, fast track, right? So toll roads, that's RFID technology. Basically, it's a chip that's going to store information until it's activated by some type of reader. So the information lives there, it's activated by something else. Now, near-field communication is sort of the same concept, except it's built, um, it's, on, it's on a shorter, you're within a shorter radius, right? So, um, and it doesn't require the authentication that Bluetooth does, right? So that's the problem with Bluetooth is there's that whole pairing process so that they'll talk to one another. NFC doesn't require that. They will talk to each other, right? You can add a layer of authentication if you need, you know, for safety or whatever else, like the RFID credit card. But, um, you know, the NFC are what sort of create these presence tags. Now, that these actually exist. Those are out there. You can buy them. Um, I'm trying to remember how much they cost. They're not very much, it's not very much to buy one of these NFC presence tags, you know, that just can live on your key ring. Um, and let, you know, start talking to the devices around you, right? Those devices get programmed with some type of NFC that's going to trigger, um, you know, either it powers on, powers off. Um, it's automation, right? So, now the other thing too is, you know, this is the interesting thing here is because these items exist, um, has anybody ever been to like a maker's fair? Maker fair? <coughs> Take a look at this. I've heard of Make Magazine. There is a group out there, people who are makers, right? They're fabbers, they're modders, they're people who like to take something and hack it, right? They take an item and they hack it and they make it do something better, something cool. So the people who are doing this are not necessarily, you know, your, um, your retiree sitting in the garage with a soldering board. Do you see this right here? This is actually a little LED um, motion um, activated light. And they're called like the flora, I think. Do you see what this is? That's fingernail polish. This is like a 14-year-old girl who has um, taken one of these LED motion sensor um, items, created, you know, customized it, programmed it using, um, uh, our, usually use Arduino or Raspberry Pi, because they're little tiny processors. Um, and, and this is like a 14-year-old girl sitting on her vans, right? So, this is not the crew that you think it is, right? This is a different set of individuals out there. Um, oh, Lady Otta here, she is the one who is responsible for the, the, the big Arduino um, uh, uh, trend, I guess. Um, so she has a $10 million business selling these little units, right, that will let you um, kind of create your own circuit board and power your circuit board. And, and I, I actually was able to modify my Wiimote, you know, the, the Wii remote, so that it became solar powered. I went to the Maker Fair, bought this little kit, and now my Wiimote is solar powered. So this is a group of people out there who are hacking, who are modifying, who are kind of, you know, revolutionizing the way that things get a voice. So take a look at, um, look up Arduino, A-R-D-U-I-N-O, um, and you'll get a feel for what's happening out there. It's pretty fascinating. And, and again, you know, this was, she's sort of the, the mastermind behind this. You know, this is a young woman who, it, like I said, now has a $10 million business and um, has sort of revolutionized the way that we look at electronics. So what's happening right now with these things on the Internet of Things funny, um, is, is sort of developing a language, right, the protocol, because that's one of the problems is that we, we talk about it in an ecosystem, but right now, you know, there's different languages, who's going to have to develop standards, how are they going to talk to one another. Um, Qualcomm has, uh, this is their project, the All Join project, and right now they, they are developing um, some apps and some other technologies that will allow um, cross-platform communication, right? So right now they actually have an app called Frisbee, um, like ph fat frisbee, it's P-H-R-I-Z-B-E, and you can share files, you can swap um, contacts and photos with people no matter what platform they're on. So this is sort of the beginning of that um, universal language where the, the, the devices can talk to one another regardless of, you know, uh, manufacturer, plat you know, operating system, all of the other hindrances that we always have. Um, all join is sort of the language that's going to let them talk to one another. And I have um, uh, that app loaded here. Um, so if anyone else wants to download it on a, maybe a Droid, we can try to play with it. I can never find anyone who has the app, so I never get to play with it. But still, it's the idea that this is that universality of language. 
NQTT.org is Cisco's project, um, sort of the same type of concept. So what's happening, we're already sort of having some of the disjoint, jointment, you know, with like, well, who's going to control this? Um, there are standards in development, so you've got um, ITU, European Commission, IEEE, and um, there are people trying to develop some standards. And again, this is in its infancy, it's really in such a conceptual place, but it's a good time to join the conversation and find out what's happening. Now, if some of you are trying to like scramble and write this down, and I always have my presentations available. Um, I put them up in a Dropbox, I'll send anyone the link if you want it, so make sure you just let me know if you need that, um, so you're not scrambling. Like I said, write all of this down. Now, on the other hand, there is a new wave of products and services out there, so um, Smart Things is sort of the hub, right? And, and the way that um, the creator of Smart Things envisions this is that this hub will speak all of those languages, whether it's Z-Wave Alliance, all join, Zigbee, no matter what these divide language these devices speak, something like the smart things will speak all of those languages. And the way that they plan to do that is just if somebody brings out a cool new language, cool new devices that are speaking in a certain language, the smart things is going to speak that same language. That's their focus, that's their goal. So look at smart things, that exists right now. Um, it's really you know, still just sort of home intelligence, but it uses it in the office as well. So, you know, as the last person walks out with their presence tag, um, you know, the, the, the office shuts down, right? So it's all automated based on presence tags. So there's no thought that's involved. There's no timer. It's based on the human being's activity and behavior. So pretty cool stuff. Um, then you have smart, um, I don't know if anybody you know Howard Newton's He's going to kill me because I just said his name totally wrong. Howard Nunes, he's with uh, Pepper Dash. And a uh, good buddy of mine, he's a programmer. He talks about when, when items, be, you know, when automation becomes smart. It's when it becomes predictive. And this is when, you know, I was talking about where our devices will not just, you know, the sprinkler head won't just say, you know, it's uh, the, the, it won't just have a sensor that the grass is dry. But it will say, well, the forecast is that it's going to rain tomorrow, so I'm actually not going to turn on today, right? So that's the next step. That's the next step where these things become um, automated and actually smart about our needs. So again, you know, some of the, the uh, it, they're, they're able to make decisions, they can fix our, um, our pain points, they, if there's, they help us achieve our goals, simplify lives, et cetera, et cetera. So um, how are we for time? So we have about seven minutes. Um, so right now, we're sort of seeing this um, develop. Um, AT&T has their digital life where we're seeing you know, some of the things have gotten a voice, and it's really mostly through power control, right? So through power control, and then also um, uh, the automation piece, right? So they're really focused on sort of like emergencies, disasters, and I'll tell you, it is needed, right? I need a home that's smarter because I don't have a phone. And just recently, you know, I'm, I'm, I was uh, in Big Bear, and my kids and I were, we rented a cabin during the summer, and there was that fire out towards Palm Springs, but I didn't know where it was at, right? And I'm in, and we had really crummy Wi-Fi reception. I didn't have any mobile reception. It was very, very low. And I'm in this home, in this cabin that I rented, thinking, oh my God, there could be a fire, you know, around the corner, and I wouldn't know. I, you know, as connected as we are, as wired as we are and everything else, I need a little more intelligence from the things around me because I don't use the communication tools that we built our emergency preparedness, that we built our responsiveness. I don't use those tools anymore, and I'm not alone. There's a lot of people who don't have home phones anymore or, you know, that just don't have these tools and devices. So, you know, really thinking about the needs of the next generation and the way that our behaviors change, you know, at and digital, digital life sort of taps into that. You see that commercial where the boy texts his mom, like, Mom, I forgot my key, can you let us in the house? And she's in the meeting, in the conference room, she's like, well, I'm out again, and she just opens up the front door for him. Right? So it's that ability to sort of control our homes, to have that experience. Um, and at and actually has a whole pet package. So remember I was talking about, you know, the, the litter box? They're making a lot of money off of our need to know when our cats are going to the bathroom. But um, they have, you know, there's these really funny commercials that they did where, you know, there's this, like, old dog, and he's like, I'm telling you, this house is inside of my head. I move from one room to the next, and the lights go on. He's like, this house is inside my head, man. It's really funny. But um, Alarm.com is sort of the same type of idea, right? So it's sort of this control over our homes. It's a lot of what we're doing right now, anyways, on a professional scale, but... I think it's kind of interesting to see what's happening in sort of that phase one and phase two, those first two triangles. Um, but on the other hand, 
you know, talk about AV and where does that fit into this, right? Because that's what we're here for. We're, we're not security people. We're not IT people. We are AV people. And where we should fit in is that we are about creating an experience, right? And this is the whole concept is that, remember when I talked about that last sentence, right? Simplifying a user experience, improving a user experience. And if we can focus on that, that's where we create the value, right? So our sprinklers will not just have the sensors, right? Because your security people can do that, AT&T can do that, they can automate a home, but we are the professionals who understand communication, who understand human behavior, who understand needs. That's the difference where we can stand out and use the technology differently. <coughs> differently. So um, experience design, right? And this is one of my favorite things. We're not the IT people, right? We don't have this association. We have the advantage, like, we're not the blue screen of death people. Well, sometimes those of us in the events industry are, but it's not necessarily the AV person. We are these people, right? We're supposed to be the people who create the cool experiences, that create the memorable experiences. And I know all of you are laughing at that because, hello, is that the best? You come rolling in with the TV like, right? I was like, yes, it's video day. Um, you know, and back in the day before that, it was the it was our um, projectors, right? It's, it's it's just one of those things that we are supposed to have a positive association. Um, wait, is that not very far? Yeah, Mystery sorry. Lodge. Yes, Mystery Lodge. Uh, I think never... that's the '86 Canada um, World's Fair, though. This? Yeah, that it was based off of. Mystery Lodge? Yeah, Mystery Lodge was inspired by the 86 Canadian Montreal World's Fair. It's not very far. Yeah, that was not very far. It was just there. That's pretty awesome, though. <laughs> I like, but yeah, but, um, well, you know, the idea, right, is like this is supposed to be AV. This is supposed to be what we do. We do cool things with projection. We create an experience. We have a positive association. That's how we get ahead. So thinking about like hospitality, where we fit in there. I talked about the airport, right? And it's not just what does the future hotel room look like. It's not just, you know, what is it like when I move around my hotel room. It's also what happens when I check in. When I check in, like the other day I checked into a Marriott, and I'm standing in line and standing, it took forever. It usually doesn't take that long, it's taking forever. Well, halfway through the line as I'm almost to the front, it says, oh, download our app and just check it automatically. And I'm like, crap. So by the time I downloaded it, got, I was at the front of the line. I'm like, well, that was great. Oh, we don't use it next time, but still. How much better would it be if I had a little presence tag or if there was an NFC or an RFID or something in my phone, I walk in, I'm tied into their system, got it, yeah. I'm tied into their system, bam, right? I'm checked in, there's a kiosk that notifies me or there's some type of visual that notifies me or I get an audio ping or something that says, hey, you're going to room such and such, go over here, you authenticate, get your keys, you're good, right? So retail, same idea. Um, those of us who have to try on bathing suits, there would be nothing finer in my world than a virtual changing room, right? Like, you know, yeah, the guys in the room are like, huh? Oh. But if you have girlfriends or wives, I mean, they dread the bathing suit shopping or jeans shopping, right? So, you know, looking at retail, the retail environment, I want to walk in and I want the gap to say, Ms. Connelly, we haven't seen you in six months, but you bought this pair of jeans, you probably will like these three products, right? We will put them into the dressing room for you. As I walk through the store, you know, I move towards the dressing room, I have a, a, a visual, um, display that shows me you have been assigned to room such and such, walk right on in, and this is what I get to do. Same thing with education, thinking about that participatory culture. Um, sorry, we have one minute. So looking at the participatory <coughs> culture, looking at the fact that we want to collaborate virtually, right? So we want to tie people in around the world. Again, you know, like I said, you can talk to Russia 24 hours a day. I kind of want to do the same thing in my learning environment, accommodating to bring your own advice. And this sort of translates into the corporate environment as well, where we're starting to see those little learning bubbles and the flipped classroom, the flipped, um, classroom experience sort of translates into business meetings, right? So a little more fluid experience. Same thing with social. Um, you know, the social thing is really big, using like RFID bands to check in or using these as, um, you know, for social events, music festivals. This is a biggie. Uh, this is the Bonner Music Festival. And they received like three million social impressions by giving people these RFID wristbands that got them into like VIP events and unlocked certain experiences. Um, and then it was all tied into Facebook for that, but it could be something else, right? So, um, whoops, sorry, we killed it. And so here's the thing that I just kind of like to leave you.
you with is that you know, some of what we talk about seem like future experiences. This one really cracks me up with back in the day. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I was a huge Jetsons fan when I was a kid. I loved that. It was like my favorite, favorite cartoon. And this cracks me up though, right? So I guess he's video conferencing Judy, but he, you know, I don't know what the record player thought. I guess it's, well, that's the only media they had, right? It was a record player at the time to, to create the audio for his video conference, his pretend video conference. It just cracks me up. It's super high tech and it's the record player. But, um, you know, how many of you at the time, I can remember being like, whoa, a video on the phone? That's so cool. It's so high tech, right? I FaceTime like every night while I'm traveling with my kids now. So, and, you know, same thing with the teachers and everything else. So, again, you know, it seems so futuristic at the time, but really, you know, it's important for us to remember that this is our lifetime. It's happening now. It may seem pretty futuristic, but, you know, if we're, if we're aware of it and we're staying tuned in and tap, tied into what's happening, um, we'll be ahead, of, be ahead of the curve and be able to stay out there as audiovisual professionals that people need in order to have um, some type of high tech experience, right? So uh, this is all my contact information. I answer the phone. I check emails. I'm on Twitter. I'm everywhere. Feel free to connect with me. If you want a copy of my slides, absolutely. They're in PDF format. I've got them in Dropbox. You can just, I'll just send you a link. So definitely get in touch with me. Um, and I think that's about it. Look at that one minute over. <laughs>